Up next on the TWIP Network, Gordon Lang and I review the Lumix GX8 on All About the Gear. Hi, it's Doug K. I'm here with another episode of All About the Gear with from Brighton, England, Mr. Gordon Lang. Good morning, afternoon, as your time zone may be, Gordon. I'm I'm still working on this first cup of coffee, so forgive me for that. How are you? Uh, I'm very well, Doug. Thanks for having me. I'm on about my 18th cup of coffee, but to make you feel at home, I've got a mug from San Francisco here. Oh, excellent. Have you been I to this place? I where is. You do? I had a very nice breakfast there long ago. Okay. Um, so the GX8 is the camera du jour. Oh, by the way, let's hope everybody appreciates a couple of things. First of all, what beautiful video quality you have today. We have upgraded the facilities at uh, All About the Gear, and Gordon Lang is bring, coming to you from the 21st century <laughs> using broadband cable. Woohoo! It's amazing. Who knew that it was available in the United Kingdom? Yeah, remarkable. Remarkable. Um, and also, uh, it's a little strange. I have a G8 here with me. A GX8. Uh, what did I say? You said a G8. Oh, a, G8, a GX8 here with me in the All About the Gear studios. Gordon Lang, who's doing this review, actually does not. He had one, but because of travel schedules and broadband schedules and everything else, um, he had to send his back. Panasonic very nicely sent me one just so that we could show it to you for this review. So we're going to be going back and forth between Gordon explaining things and me pointing them out, hopefully on the camera. Doug, that's probably my one. Uh, I know it's not because it's brand new. <laughs> it is I'm Gordon. very careful with my review samples. Uh, yeah, that's right. I polished okay. them before returning. Gordon, go, go ahead and just launch into the thing. To what, what is the GX8 and why does it, why does it exist on our planet? Okay, the GX8 is uh, a kind of high-end mirrorless camera. It costs $1,199 US dollars for the body alone, or about £999 if you're in the UK. So that places it in the same category as models like Fujifilm's X-T1 and the Olympus OMD EM5 Mark II. So it's pitched at somebody, an enthusiast or semi-professional type photographer who demands a lot of high-quality features, tough build all three of those cameras i mentioned have got weatherproofing and they're very very capable cameras so it's somebody who's uh, either using it semi-professionally or is upgrading from a, a cheaper model uh, or somebody you just you know they, they want they want something that's that's very high quality and is going to last them so it kind of represents towards the top of the range of its part of the market before you move on to things like full frame models uh, which obviously panasonic doesn't do very good. Um, now, this replaces the GX7. We don't need to talk too much about it, but that's a camera that's out oh, about a couple of years ago. It was a good camera. I, I just got to say, overall, I am blown away still by how quickly all of these cameras have gotten so much better. Uh, as we go to second and third generations of these things, they are the manufacturers of everything from Sony, Fuji, Panasonic, Olympus. They are packing these cameras with features and uh especially people panasonic is quite good at listening to their users and incorporating features from their higher end cameras into their lower end cameras yeah so this is actually even though it's called a gx8 it's the third in the gx series so first of all there's the gx1 that makes sense right the first one and it was quite a small camera, a very, very small compact camera. It's in fact the camera that I took when I left New Zealand on a three-week holiday and never went back. So it's the camera that I used solely for about a year and a half of travel around the world. And I, I loved the, uh, the GX1 because it was so small. And then Panasonic kind of rethought their range, came out with the GM series that was even smaller. So that gave an opportunity for the GX series to become more sophisticated for enthusiasts. So they came out with the GX7. There was no two, three, four, five, or six. It went straight for the seven. And there was a lot of good things about that. But it got actually significantly larger. Now the GX8 is even bigger still. When you when you have a look at it, I don't know how well you remember the, the GX7. The GX8 has become quite a chunky camera now. I mean, it's still a lot smaller than a, a DSLR in this price bracket. But it is not a small camera anymore. If you want a small micro four thirds camera from Panasonic, you should be looking at the, the GM5, which is uh, super cute. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, I noticed that, you know, I did have a chance to go out and shoot with this thing. And, you know, I've been used to some relatively small cameras these days, and this is getting, starting to feel like a bigger camera. Of course, you say that until you pick up, you know, a full frame Nikon DSLR or a Canon, then suddenly you realize that these micro four thirds cameras or all the mirrorless cameras are in fact quite a bit smaller. So this one I'm showing here uh, is the GX8 with a lens I'm going to ask you about, which is the 12 to 35 fixed aperture F2.8. Uh, I was quite impressed with this lens. We can talk about that. Um, so let's talk, I'll, I'll point out a couple of features that I know they've added here, and then you can fill in a few things. One is they have a fully articulated screen. So you've got uh, one that goes in essentially almost every direction that you could possibly want. That's really nice. Let's remember, I think the GX7 also had this tilt-up viewfinder, if I'm not mistaken, didn't it? It did. So the tilt-up viewfinder arrived on the GX7. The GX1 did not have a viewfinder built in. That was one of the big new features of the GX7 over the original model. The GX1 had one you could slide on the hot shoe, but that you, no one ever does. Who slides a viewfinder on the hot shoe? I don't know. Maybe you do. Write in the comments. Tell us. But having it built in is obviously a lot more convenient. So they built it in the GX7, and one of the unique things they did was have that tiltable function. Uh, which they've retained for the GX8, and it's still pretty unique. I can't think of any other cameras in this kind of uh, category that offers anything like that. The big question is, though, Doug, would you did you use the tiltable viewfinder? Uh, I did not use it this time because I didn't shoot enough, but I have in the past. Um, you know, if you want to shoot from down low, which is obviously what this is designed for, unless what you're doing is holding it up like this and shooting up into the sky. <laughs> uh, yes, I have used it. But to be honest, once you have a uh, an LCD that will do this, there's really not much need for the tiltable viewfinder because you can go like this. I could turn the camera on so people could see my beautiful wall here. And um you know, once you've got this, you might as well just shoot, use this if you want to shoot from down low. There's not much need to open this up because to do that, you're still probably going to have to bend over to look at it. That way you don't have to. So, no, not a big feature for me. I mean, obviously, the benefit of doing it with the viewfinder is that there's the privacy aspect, there's the um, a bit of stability because it's being held closer to your face, although not as close to your face as it would if it was uh, angled back as normal, and also shielded from the sun. So if you're shooting in very bright conditions, then you may still use it. But I completely agree. If I want to shoot at unusual angles, which I actually do all the time, then I would be using the articulated screen. And it's very important to point out that the screen on the GX7 only tilted vertically. So this is an upgrade on the GX8 that has become fully articulated, side hinged, and that to me is the best way of doing it. I love this degree of articulation. I use it all the time. Now, you might think, well, what's the benefit of a flip out screen compared to one that vertically tilts? And the answer is if you're shooting in the um, landscape or horizontal aspect ratio, there isn't a lot of advantage because it tilts up and down so you can shoot high or low. But as soon as you turn your camera to the portrait aspect ratio, the tall um, shape, which I do a lot, and it's a great shape for the Micro Four Thirds format because, lest we forget, it's not three by two. It's not that wide. It's four by three. It's a little bit squarer, the, the aspect ratio. So it works really well in the portrait orientation. Well, in that instance, if you've got the camera held that way around, you need a fully articulated screen if you want to compose at higher or low angles. And of course, as you demonstrated there, you can flip the screen back on itself for protection as well. So I'm really, really pleased that, that this is a big upgrade on the GX8. And while we're talking about composition, because for me, composition is the biggest highlight on the GX8. Whatever the headline features are, whatever Panasonic says, for me, the screen and the viewfinder are the best bits of this camera. The screen, as I said, is now fully articulated and it uses no LED panel. But more importantly, there's an OLED panel in the viewfinder, and it's four by three shapes. Now, on the GX7, the viewfinder panel was 16 by nine shaped. It was really thin and wide. Perfect if you're filming HD video, but if you're taking stills in the native four by three aspect ratio of micro four thirds, then basically you're wasting a lot. You have big black bars running down the side. And of course, there's a finite number of pixels, a finite amount of detail on one of these panels. So if you're not filling it, you're losing potential detail and you lo you're losing potential size as well. It, the image didn't look very big when you were shooting in four by three. But worse for me, the GX7 used a, a panel technology. I think it was field sequential, but it's the one that if you glance very quickly from left to right, some people, 
including me, can see a kind of rainbow tearing artifact. And it, it actually makes my eyes water. So it's the wrong shape, the wrong technology. With the GX8, it is now four by three shaped. So you use the whole panel when you're framing or playing back uh, stills. It's an OLED, which means it's a beautiful looking panel that stays steady and artifact free, very vibrant colors, but not unrealistic colors. And they've also applied a high magnification to it. So the magnification on this viewfinder is now in the same ballpark as the Fuji X-T1 and the Sony A7R Mark II. And that ranks it as one of the best electronic viewfinders on the market. So for me, composition has gone on the GX7 from being a bit annoying or disappointing to one of the best out of any of these uh, mirrorless cameras. And just as an aside, if you're used to shooting with a DSLR, the image that you will get on one of those electronic viewfinders is much, much larger. Yeah, yeah, the uh, magnification is great. Um, you know, I just want to say one comment that I've got on these things, and that is, to me, one of the most important things about a fully articulated uh, LCD is video. I don't know why, but I much prefer to shoot video like this than shooting video like this, even with a tilting LCD. For some reason, I don't know why, but being able to swing it out par partially is that when I shoot video, I want for some reason, I, I want to see my live subject directly while I shoot the video. Of course, when you're shooting a still, you can have your eye glued to the camera for the moment that you take the exposure. But when you're shooting video and you might shoot for, I don't know, five minutes or something like that, or even 20 seconds, you want to watch the live action separate from the viewfinder. So for some reason, I really like being able to swing that out. I completely agree. It's a very interesting observation. I've also noticed that when I'm filming video, I use the screen flipped out like that, slightly lower an angle. I'd never thought about why I did that. And I think you're right that if you're going to be composing for that amount of time, actively composing, you know, and adjusting and watching that you don't bump into things or that someone's not pulling a face behind you or doing this, then, you know, you do need to look above the camera, don't you? So yeah. I, think you've, I think you've nailed it, Doug. <laughs> okay. I'm just, I'm just used to that. Going back to my video days, I won't tell you how many years ago that was in, uh, in serious video, but uh, it's a, a long time ago. Um, so, and so let's talk about that because my sense of this camera is that, you know, we've always talked about the fact that Panasonic as compared to all the other mirrorless cameras really is a leader in video. They, they make, I think professional level video cameras as well. Um, and video has always been their forte in mirrorless cameras. Uh, and this camera continues that. It is 4K, right? Yep. It basically inherits the video features of the Lumix G7. So you get 4K video, which has now become not a premium option for Panasonic, but pretty much a standard option across the range, which is great. So while a lot of companies are still ooh, dabbling with it, shall we implement it or not, they're implementing it across as many cameras as they can. So you get 4K video, which has doubled the resolution of um, 1080p, both horizontal and vertically. I should note it's UHD, ultra high definition. So it's the 16 by 9 TV aspect ratio. It's not the wider cinema 4K. If you want that, in Panasonic's range, it's currently only the flagship GH4 that offers that. But still, there's nothing to complain about with UHD. You might think, and we've had this conversation before, so I'll, I'll refer people to our G7 video that we did earlier. You might think, why do I want a, a 4K video capability anyway? I don't have a 4K TV, or maybe you do. If you don't, the reason is when you put 4K video on a 1080 timeline, you can effectively zoom in with no loss of quality. So it's like you can zoom and pan within the frame and still end up with 1080 quality, which is fantastic. Also, the video quality looks great when you take 4K and you simply scale it down to 1080. So you frame as normal, but just scale it down. It looks really, really nice. But Panasonic has also done something very clever with their 4K video, which is that they've gone, hang on a minute, 4K video, that frame is actually 8 megapixels in resolution. And we're capturing it at up to 30 frames per second on these cameras. I wonder what it would look like if we captured stills from that. Now, grabbing stills from video is not a new thing, but the thing that is new is that the video is getting high enough quality for those stills to look pretty good. And this is something Panasonic did a few models back and they've continued here. It has a 4K photo mode. Interestingly, on the G7, it was featured on the mode dial. You'll notice there isn't a 4K photo position on the mode dial of the GX8. You access it with the other drive option. So it's kind of hidden away slightly. But what it lets you do is film a bit of 4K footage and then very easily in playback, all on the camera, 
actually choose a frame and extract it as an eight megapixel JPEG. And, and I did a demonstration of that on the Lumix G7 review in All About the Gear. So if you want to see that in practice, please check that out because it works surprisingly well. It's very easy. It's not just suitable for action either. I've used it in portrait scenarios, especially with kids when their expressions and the direction of their eyes can change very quickly and unpredictably. You can find that if you're shooting at 30 frames per second, it's very easy to cycle back and forth in the camera until you get the absolute decisive moment. So it's a nice feature that you get on the GX8. And, and that's one of the features I did go out and test the other day when I first got this camera. And there, there are three modes for this. You know, this whole idea of shooting 4K for the purpose of stills fascinates me. Um, so I went out and there are three modes. One mode uh, is simply a what you sort of expect, which is, I'll, I'll show it to you here. You hold down the shutter release button. And while I'm holding down, it's shooting 4K video. And then when I let up, it stops shooting 4K video. Pretty straightforward. Another mode is sort of a toggle. So you push it once, it starts to shoot, and then you push it again and it stops. And then there's a third mode, which is, I forget what they call it, but the, it's basically always shooting. And the idea is that from the time you press the shutter release button, uh, it's actually going to save some number of seconds prior to the point at which you push the button. The only problem is it's burning up batteries like crazy. It freaks you out that mode a little bit because you're so used to pressing the button when you see the decisive moment. It takes a lot of unlearning to press the button after the decisive moment and not just immediately after, but a second or so after. So you see the cool thing happen. Basically, imagine I mean, you say you're, you're uh, filming somebody doing snowboard tricks or, you know, on a bike or a skateboard and you're waiting for the bit where they twirl around or whatever. So you're following them and then they do it. And then as soon as they land it and kind of move off the frame. So when you're confident that you finished that moment, then you press the button. And yeah. it, it's really hard. I was testing some of these cameras and, and I was switching between continuous shooting and that 4K mode. And doing the continuous burst traditionally where you, you follow it and as soon as it does what you want it to do or you anticipate it's going to do what you want, dig, 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 you start shooting. But with this, you're following it and you're going, has, has the cool bit happened yet? Yes, it's happened. Now press the button. Yeah, it, it takes practice. And I, I admit to it being relatively non-intuitive. But I, I looked at what I did. First of all, we... I think it's worth talking about this a little bit because this is an important feature of this camera and increasingly some of the other cameras. The image quality was quite good. And of course, in that mode, you don't, you, you want to typically make, I find I want to use a shutter speed that's more like a still frame shutter speed because I know I don't want the motion blur that I'm going to get from using, let's say, a 60th of a second. So I can set this to a 125th or a 250th of a second uh, and, and shoot that way. It's going to make a poor video, but very good stills. Now, there are two ways to get the images out that I found. One is, in camera, when you play this back, you can actually um, uh, scan. I don't know, scan is not the right word, but you can move back and forth in time. And then when you find a frame that you like, you press, press the touch screen and it says, do you want to save the image? And you save it, and now you have, as you said, an 8-megapixel JPEG. Uh, the other option is to take that movie file and bring it into something like Photoshop. And in Photoshop, you can simply save a still image. You can move the timeline in Photoshop, pick the one you want. The advantage of doing it the latter way is you get to see the image larger and in more detail. Because as you try and make this decision in the camera, you're looking at a relatively small image on the back of the camera. That's very true. That's very true. But it is the unique capability of the Panasonic because Sony's now offering 4K video on a couple of its most recent mirrorless cameras, but they don't have this interface in camera. So you have to do it all out of camera. So the thing that makes the Panasonic unique is partly ability to film 4K, but secondly, the ability to extract in camera. I completely agree, though, is that, you know, especially if you're filming maybe with a telephoto with a shallow depth of field, you might not be able to check to see if the focus is just right. But I find it, I actually really like the interface. I think it works. It works very, very well. Yeah. When, when this first started and I first tested these cameras, I wasn't 
convinced that this was viable. Uh, I, we talked about the fact that I was shooting a baseball game and at 30 frames a second, you're actually probably going to, you might miss the decisive moment. You might hit the moment when the ball is uh, in the frame uh, when it's being thrown to the batter and the catcher catches it and all that. But um, in any case, it's a very effective method. I think it's gotten much better. Uh, I want to move on to a couple of other things about this camera. So they've changed the sensor. Um, we used to think that sensors were pretty much finished in terms of sensor size. What have they done here? Well, since 2011, I think Micro Four Thirds, that was when Micro Four Thirds made the jump from 12 to 16 megapixels, and it's been stuck at 16 megapixels ever since. Now, I'm going to jump in there and say stuck is probably a bit of an unfair word because it suggests that they can't go any further, that they're really limited in this way. And admittedly, the sensor area is quite small compared to some of the formats, but I Personally, I'm completely satisfied by 16 megapixels. I shoot micro four thirds for most of my personal work. And do you know when I look at the pictures or show them to other people, the comment that they never say is great picture, shame there's not a bit more resolution. Nobody has ever said that to me at any point. But anyway, that's a personal thing. Now Panasonic has raised the bar or pushed it a little further from 16 to 20 megapixels. This makes it the highest resolution Micro Four Thirds body to date. The Olympus OMD EM5 Mark II is also 16 megapixels. It's got a clever 40 megapixel mode that actually uses the image stabilization to shift the sensor around to take eight pictures and it comps them together into one. It does genuinely have about 40 megapixels worth of resolution with the right lens, but it also has to have the right subject, the subject that's not moving during that capture and assembly process. Whereas what the Panasonic GX80 is doing is generally capturing a higher resolution image on each frame. So the question is, is the quality any better? Well, I've now actually completed my test of the GX8, so I can talk about this. And I used it with a variety of lenses and I compared it against lots of different cameras. And under very ideal circumstances, I was recording more detail with the GX8 than I was with 16 megapixel Micro Four Thirds bodies, but it was subtle. And that was under best case scenarios as well. I was getting fractionally higher real life detail, but at high ISOs, fractionally higher noise. And I've got to say it's fraction in both cases, fractionally higher detail, fractionally higher noise. Not enough extra detail to turn me on and not enough extra noise to turn me off. Mm -hmm. So for me, the 20 megapixel thing is, is pure marketing. It's, an, it's a numbers game. It's so that they can market this camera more competitively on the shelves because, unfortunately, that's how a lot of cameras are sold these days. You know, they have to have a number on the shelf and people are going, oh, that one's only got 16. This one's got 24. That's too big a gap. But difference between 20 and 24, maybe not so bad. But for me, really, I wouldn't choose or indeed eliminate the GX8 based on its high resolution. It doesn't, to, didn't, in my tests, offer sufficient advantages, and neither did the minor increase in noise offer sufficient disadvantages. Right. So I'm like, Meh, on the 20 <laughs> megapixel. <laughs> and, and, you know, those... Those pixels on this camera are really teeny, tiny, tiny pixels. Uh, you know, this sensor is about one quarter, is exactly one quarter the size of a full frame uh, sensor. So it's the equivalent of having 80 meg megapixels on a full frame sensor, which is very high resolution. And as you and I know, uh, we've talked about this on previous shows, I will get uh, email roughly once a week of people who write in and say, you know, I've got a problem. I've got the greatest, the latest and greatest micro four thirds camera. And I go out and I try to shoot pictures. I stop down to F16, you know, because I know that's where my lens is going to be the sharpest. And uh, I get back and I zoom in one-to-one -one and everything is soft. And what's happening is uh, because the pixels are so small, you're actually getting more of the uh, effects of diffraction in the lens. Not a lens flaw. It's just a, a matter of physics. But what you need to do in these cameras uh, high-res cameras, and a micro four-thirds camera is a high-res sensor because the pixels are so small, is you need to open up your lens, actually. It's not what you've been taught to do in the past, but, you know, I think you've got to open up to five, six or so uh, in order to really get the maximum benefit without side effects of diffraction. Actually, I'd say five, six is slightly pushing it a bit for micro four-thirds. I think F4 is more optimal, certainly in the test that I've done. But I would encourage everybody at some point, if they're into this, to stick their cameras on a tripod, a distant subject, so depth of field does not become an issue. 
and shoot it at every aperture setting and then just open them up in Photoshop, put them all next to each other and see which ones look crispest to you. Remember, you're not looking at depth of field. Look at the area that you're focused on and see how good that looks. And for me, generally for Micro Four Thirds, it's around F4, sometimes F2.8. On APS-C, around F5.6 is fairly optimal. And on full frame or 35 millimeter, it's around F8, which is, of course, what we all learned if you come from the film days, which is that lenses work. The system seems to work at its best at F8, but that's only if you're talking about a larger format. So yeah, if you shoot Micro Four Thirds at F4, unless we forget, that also means the effective depth of field compared to full frame is also going to be approximately F8. Then, uh, then F4 is what you want to shoot at. But I, I, you know, I, the thing I really like about Micro Four Thirds is the sensor is small, but I see that as a benefit, not a downside, because it means they can design very high quality lenses that are very sharp right up to the edges and into the corners that are small and light and relatively affordable. If you want that degree of performance on a larger format, it's going to be a bigger, heavier and more expensive lens. So you've got to look at the whole system. I have people, you say you get those emails about diffraction. I get emails all the time, people going, oh, you know, I'd never select this because it's a small sensor. And it's like, well, fine. But if you go for a big sensor, you've got to have a big lens if you want autofocus as well. So there's pros and cons to both. And certainly as someone who does a lot of traveling and uses a backpack and I'm on foot a lot of the time, I like having lots of little light, but also very high quality lenses. And I love because I shoot architecture a lot, it's so nice to be able to zoom in on areas at the edges of the frame and know that they're going to look great. You know, whereas with a lot of DSLR or larger format lenses, you know, as soon as you get towards the corners, it's not always looking great. Yeah. And wh why we're there, let's talk about this lens a little bit. This is, uh, I think it's called a pro, you know, it's essentially a pro level lens in the micro four thirds world. It's a 12 to 35 millimeter, which is again, from a field of view perspective, that is the equivalent of a 24 to 70, the classic mid range zoom that the pros might use on a full frame camera. It's a fixed aperture F 2 eight. So again, it's really going head to head with those 24 to 70 lenses, but look at the size of this thing. This lens is, I'm going to guess, about one-third the weight of the 24 to 70 I have on my Nikon. Uh, and my experience, again, just from about one day of shooting, was that the quality of the lens is quite good. The quality of that lens is very good, uh, but it's very important now you've brought up your uh, Nikon or a Canon equivalent, or even a Sony full-frame equivalent, is that that lens there, the Lumix 12 to 35, is not a full-frame lens. It's a quarter full frame lens, as we said, for Micro Four Thirds. So when you're shooting at f2.8 on that, the depth of field isn't going to be anywhere near as shallow as the depth of field you'll get on a full frame 24 to 70 f2.8. And that's the thing I don't really like about that 12 to 35 lens. I think a lot of people may have moved from a full frame system to this, gone, oh, I'll just replace my 24 to 70 with this. Hey, isn't it light? This is great. And then they zoom it into the 70 mil equivalent, you know, 35. And they're shooting portraits at f2.8, and they're going, hang on, that background is actually still quite well defined. Why isn't it as blurry as it is on my full frame? And it's because the field reduction that we have to apply to the focal length also applies to the effective depth of field. So if you want to match the depth of field you're getting at f2.8 on full frame, you need f1.4 on micro four thirds, which is why I've kind of given up with zooms on micro four thirds for almost all of the lenses that I carry. And I shoot primes, 1.8 primes or 1.4 primes. And those are bright enough and have a sufficiently shallow depth of field to get that blurry effect. So if you are thinking of switching from full frame to one of these smaller formats, you may need faster focal ratio lenses than you think. So while we're on the subject of that 12 to 35 millimeter lens, one of the other things to mention about it is that it has optical image stabilization. This is Panasonic's solution for counteracting camera shake. It, it, it adjusts lenses, uh, various elements or element within the lens to combat camera shake. Whereas their rival in Micro Four Thirds, Olympus, they favor a sensor-based system, which shifts the sensor and works with pretty much any lens you attach on it. That's the benefit of the sensor-based system. Now, interestingly, Panasonic, despite being very pro optical stabilization, actually introduced sensor-based stabilization on the earlier GX7. But in my test, it was nowhere near as effective as the Olympus system. I found that on the older GX7, I was only getting one or two stops of compensation with a non-stabilized lens, compared to four to five stops on the Olympus system. 
unless we forget models like the GX8 do go up against things like the EM5 Mark II, which has got eerily good uh, sensor-based stabilization. But what Panasonic have done now is found a way to make the optical stabilization, if you have it in a lens, work alongside the sensor-based stabilization. So rather than having to choose one or the other or have them conflict with each other, they can now work together and become even better. And Panasonic calls this dual IS, and it's a new feature on the GX8. Obviously, you need an optically stabilized lens for this to work. For example, the 12 to 35 that you have there, and that's the one I use for my tests. Now, when you test that lens in isolation, the optical stabilization gives you about three and a bit stops of compensation. I found if you have dual IS on the GX8, that that is extended to about four and a bit, maybe five stops of compensation. So it's enhancing the optical stabilization and bringing it up to a point that's roughly equivalent to what I can achieve with the Olympus system. But the important difference here is that the Olympus is giving me that on an unstabilized lens. If I fit an unstabilized lens to the GX8, I'm still only getting one or two stops. I'm only getting five stops out of the Panasonic when I have an optically stabilized lens. So what the dual IS system is doing is it's enhancing that. Whereas on the Olympus, I'm getting it regardless of the lens. I'm getting five stops regardless. Now there is one point at which Panasonic system becomes superior and that's a longer focal lens. You see, the thing is with a sensor-based stabilization, there's only so much that sensor can move. And if you're dealing with a super telephoto lens, then, you know, the degree of compensation that you need becomes bigger than with a wide angle or a normal lens. And if you've got optical stabilization built into the lens, you can optimize it for that. You just keep building in bigger and bigger elements that shift in a bigger and bigger way to compensate for that bigger and bigger focal length. So because dual IS on the GX8 employs optical stabilization as well, it can use the benefit of that on longer lenses. And you'll probably see the difference about 250, 300 millimeters, that sort of range and up. That's an effective focal length. If you're dealing with focal lengths like that, then you may get a stabilization benefit on the GXA over the Olympus, so long as that lens has stabilization. If it doesn't, all bets are off. The Olympus is miles better. But if it does have stabilization, the Panasonic can exploit that and deliver a slightly better result. But again, only at the long focal lens. Like all testing, You've got to go well under what conditions are you doing this? Are you doing this and that? And for me, I've got a collection of mostly unstabilized lenses. So for me, the Olympus system is much better because it's giving me like five stops, whereas the Panasonic's only giving me one to two. But if you only have stabilized lenses from, say, Panasonic, some of their more recent ones, and you'll notice that they're putting OIS, optical image stabilization, on more and more of their new lenses, then it can work really nicely with the GX8. So if you've got most of those lenses, it's a non-issue. But for me... It is an issue, and that's why I prefer Olympus bodies, because they work better with the lenses that I own. Have you ever stopped to think about how weird it is that we refer to how many stops of image stabilization improvement we get? Because, you know, it's not like we're opening up our apertures. It's really, isn't it really a matter of how long you can hold this thing in your hand without jiggling it too much? Isn't that what it comes down to? Exactly. So if you're the old rule would say one over the effective focal length for a, a fair resolution uh, system, we've already discussed on pre previous reviews that as you're going for ultra high res systems that that can change. But if you're talking about an, an average system, say you've got a 50 mil equivalent lens, let's say you need a 50th of a second to handhold that without camera shake, without stabilization. Well, one stop of compensation would let you do it at 25th, two stops would let you do it at 13th, three stops would let you do it at a sixth. Four stops would let you do it at a third. Five stops would let you do it at a one over 1.5. And it keeps going on to a point where I can actually handhold a semi-wide angle lens on the OMD EM5 Mark II at one second, or if I brace myself, at two seconds. And what that allows me to do is handhold shots without a tripod uh, in the blue hour at dawn or dusk without bumping up the ISO or without opening the aperture up too wide. So... You know, it's completely transformed the way that I shoot. So I, I love that stabilization has got this good. Yeah, I just want people to understand that the, the benefit of this is being able to avoid the use of a tripod when you might otherwise need a tripod. It it uh, It's not something that you're likely to use for shooting your kids and your families or any other moving subjects because you're talking now about trying to get longer and longer shutter speeds. That's the real feature of this. It's yeah, absolutely. It, it is more light, but it's more light over time as opposed to more light in terms of sensitivity. 
So it's no good if your subject is moving. I mean, I may now be able to handhold a one second exposure, but I need the subject to stay completely still. So it's for buildings and landscapes. Yeah. It's not when I'm doing street photography, cool. I have an optically image. Uh, I have an OIS camera, which I turn off because I'm usually shooting at a 250th of a second anyway. So mm -hmm. interesting thing. Hey, a couple, you know, I, I went over to cameralabs.com and I recommend that everybody go to cameralabs.com because you will find the most thorough rever reviews you can possibly imagine over there. And the GX8 review is no exception. There is so much there that in preparation for this show, uh, I was up all night reading Gordon's <laughs> review. But I learned so much about this camera. It was just marvelous. One of the things that I learned, because I didn't remember it, was that they have changed the grip somewhat on this camera. And I found this camera to be very comfortable to hold, even with this slightly long lens. Tell us about the change to that part of the body. Well, as you've pointed out, the uh, if you look at the GX7, the older model, that, that had very little grip at all compared to the GX8. And by fitting a bigger grip, there's two benefits. The first is that there's obviously more to hold on to, which is nice. But the second thing is that it's allowed them to move the, uh, the shutter release further forward. And this seems to be a very popular trend at the moment. Sony have done it on the A7 Mark II models and everyone else is doing it as well. So the shutter is slightly further forward and, and often angled and that's a bit more comfortable for, for your index finger. So I'm pleased with that. The dials have also changed a little bit, although for me, the rear thumb dial is a bit too flush with the rear surface. So when you're turning it, you're kind of like rubbing the back of the body a bit too much as well, which um, try it, Doug, see what you think when you try the, the thumb dial on the, uh, that's it. It's a bit too close to the body. And for me, the clicks are not positive enough. This is a very personal thing. You know, how positive are your clicks? Some people like them a bit looser. Do you like a looser click or a, I like a stiffer click. And <laughs> um, unfortunately, it was, uh, it left me lacking. It left me wanting more positivity. The other interesting thing they've done with that rear um, thumb dial is you'll notice a button on the top of it. That button can be configured to actually switch the function of the finger and thumb dials in the same way that there's a switch on the back of the higher end Olympus bodies, their two by two system. So, for example, by default, you could have one operating the shutter and one operating the aperture or one doing one hers and the other doing exposure compensation. And then when you press the button, it could momentarily switch them to, say, ISO and white balance. And then you press it again and it switches back again. So it's a quick and easy way of kind of doubling the functionality of those uh, dials. And speaking of functions, the, the GX8 is absolutely scattered with customizable function buttons. There's uh, there's loads of them on there. Other features we've not mentioned, it's got a great Wi-Fi implementation with a really good uh, app for iOS and Android. Built-in time-lapse, and it is possible to generate 4K video time-lapses all in camera. I have an example of that in my review. They work brilliantly at up to 30 frames per second with their 4K as well, whereas some cameras which are advertising 4K time-lapse are only doing so at a very low frame rate. Seven uh, frame auto exposure bracketing, if you're into that kind of thing. Silent shooting with a fully electronic shutter, if you like, up to 16 thousandth of a second. The mechanical shutter is 8 thousandth of a second. And the last thing I wanted to talk about was autofocus because the thing that Panasonic's and Olympus bodies have always been very good at is single autofocus. This is where the camera focuses on a subject and says, right, I found it and that's it. Now, Panasonic does this very, very quickly and in very, very low light levels. And the face detection works very, very well on it too. So if you're taking just normal portraits or just normal shots around and about, I find it extremely satisfying to use. The continuous autofocus is an area where it still lacks compared to bodies that have got embedded phase detect AF points. This is something that's still lacking on Micro Four Thirds. Yes, it's on the Olympus EM1, but only under certain circumstances. Generally speaking, the Micro Four Thirds system from Panasonic and Olympus is contrast-based only, which means when it's focusing, it has to go past and come back to confirm, which is fine if your subject's stationary, but if your subject is moving, it reduces the speed at which you can shoot. I found Panasonic quotes about six frames per second with continuous AF on the GX8. I found it's more like about four or five. Eight frames per second without continuous AF, but with continuous AF, about four or five. So that doesn't blow out the water 
if you're comparing it to say the Sony a6000 which can shoot at 11 frames per second and can track much faster subjects so again this kind of body is lacking if you want to shoot very serious sports and for me there's a little feeling that if there was a chance to redesign that sensor I mean did they buy the sensor or did they design the sensor if they designed the sensor at some point the conversation the question would have come up how many megapixels do we put on it do we bother with embedded face detect and the answer was for whatever reason no we don't why didn't they do it obviously you have to spend some of those pixels you have to devote some of them to phase detect af canon's worked out a way of switching them back and forth but everyone else has to devote it maybe panasonic don't want to throw away pixels you know there's so little sensor area on this they, they may feel it's too precious but for me, if you're if you're in that meeting and you're redesigning the sensor and you and you've decided to make it twenty, I'd have sooner they stuck with sixteen and maybe embedded phase detect AF because it would have banished the one area where it falls behind some rivals like Sony. If it had, if it could do continuous auto focus at ten frames per second, wouldn't that be amazing? Then it'd be like, well, that's it. Micro Four Thirds is one of the best formats overall. But as it stands, I feel there's always this caveat. That I have to say that it's great at everything except for very fast sports. Fine for slowish sports. If it's your kid kind of, if it's a small kid running, it's okay. If it's a big kid running, <laughs> less so. Small dogs, okay. Big dogs, maybe not. On Brighton seafront, there's people casually cy cycling their bikes. Fine for that. And indeed, I have examples of that on my review. People doing like Tour de France type speed, not fine. And yet that is something that the Sony A6000 can do. And I wish they could do it too. Was there that opportunity in that meeting when they redesigned that sensor to do it? Maybe it's not possible. You know, sometimes the actual AF drive on these lenses prevents these things from happening. It's easy for us journalists and reviewers and photographers to go, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? But actually in some engineer's room in Japan, there's a, a very valid technical reason why it's simply not possible. It's not a marketing decision sometimes it's a technical thing i don't know the answer no. all i do know is that i wish it could do it it can do it just not brilliantly yeah i know exactly what you mean now, you mentioned the a6000 we can come back to that but let's let's generally wrap this up by comparing it to what else is out there and helping people figure out whether this is the right camera for them uh I guess the first question, there are two questions. One is, if you're already committed to the Micro Four Thirds world, is this the right camera? But the two cameras that you compared this to in your written review primarily were the Olympus OMD EM5 Mark II, which is a fairly new camera, also Micro Four Thirds, but you also compared it to the Fuji X-T1. So how do you position this camera relative to those other two, which are both excellent cameras? Well, all three are in the same sort of ballpark in terms of price and general functionality. As I said at the top of the show, all three of them are weatherproof cameras. They're all capable of shooting quickly. They've all got a ton of features and access to a great lens catalog. So if you bought any three of these cameras, any one of these three cameras, you're not going to go, oh, my camera sucks. You're going to get a fantastic camera. They're all great. What you have to do is really drill down and look at the features to see which one may be better for certain types of photography. Now, for me, we've said it before, and we're going to say it again, the Panasonic is better than either of those two brands at video. And if you are either going to do a lot of video or even just some video, the Panasonic is going to do it better. So if that's a priority, I would go for the GX8 compared to those. The X-T1, for me, is not quite as fancy as the Olympus and Panasonic in terms of features, but I do love their imaging pipeline. They have a slightly larger sensor. They've stuck at 16 megapixels, but it's got a different color filter away, a different architecture. That coupled with their image processing and also their optics, the entire imaging pipeline, and the film simulations, similar simulations produces, for me, superior image quality. Now, the handling may not be as good. It certainly doesn't focus as fast in low light. The Fuji is not a camera I'm that happy taking out when I'm shooting my kids, although it does, ironically, actually have quite good continuous AF if the subject's in the middle. But when I'm shooting fine art, landscapes, that sort of thing, and I recently did a load of long exposure photography with it. If you follow me socially, you'll see a lot of long exposure photos recently. And they were all done, mostly done with the X-T1. It just does it really well, and it's a very clean result without noise reduction. I prefer that image quality. Meanwhile, the Olympus comes along with the EM5 Mark II, which is probably my 
favorite camera in this category. The stabilization just works amazingly well, amazingly well, and it's transformed the way I shoot. It's got a fully articulated touchscreen like the uh, the Panasonic. I should note the Fujifilm's screen only tilts vertically and does not offer touch sensitivity. Um, it really depends a lot between the Panasonic and the Olympus, depending on which lenses you're going to use. If you're going to be using mostly unstabilized lenses, like I do, then the Olympus is the preferred choice because the stabilization works so much better. But if most of your lenses that you either own or are thinking of buying have optical image stabilization, then the GX8 can give them that little turbo boost with its dual IS and make them work that little bit better. So it may be your preferred choice there. Ultimately, I would really recommend that you pick them up because what you'll find is that one may have the best features of all for your style of photography, but when you pick it up, you're like, oh, Turn those dials, check that positivity click, press the shutter release, listen to the noise it makes, look through the viewfinder, twist it around. How does it feel to you? And I think it's very, very important that you buy a camera that when you put it down on a shelf or a desk, it goes, please take pictures with me. Please pick me up, and take me out. And some cameras do that and some don't. And that's very, very personal. It's like a favorite jumper or a hat or something. And you could have technically the best camera in the world and one that's ideally suited to your type of photography. But if you don't want to pick it up and use it, you're not going to pick it up and use it. And I just like, personally, this is completely personal now. This is a biased opinion that I'm giving you. I like the controls on the Olympus. But equally, I know some people don't and prefer the dials and the controls on the Fuji or the Panasonic. So this is why, for me, the Olympus is the preferred choice because I personally like the controls and I have lenses that are not stabilized. So they work very well on that system. Yeah. But now, I'll, I'll throw in a little bit, a little bit of my own take on it too. I don't have nearly the experience you do with shooting with these. I have shot with all of these cameras, but not as extensively. For me, uh, if I wanted video, I would go for the GX8 if that was the most important thing to me. If the image stabilization was the most important thing, I would definitely go with the Olympus OMD EM5 Mark II. I love that camera. Uh, but if it was image quality and usability for me, I happen to like the Fuji. I happen to love those controls uh, because they feel the most, I guess, first of all, they're a little more traditional in terms of being a little bit more like a film camera. Uh, and I, I just love that camera. You, as you said, you can't go wrong with any of these three cameras. Now, let me. Here's, here's my top tip, though, Doug. Is that if you can issue weather sealing, if you do not need weather sealing, have a look. And you like video, have a look at the Panasonic Lumix G7, which we've also already reviewed because it's almost half the price, and it has the same 4K video. It has a great viewfinder. It has a fully articulated touchscreen. It has a lot of the features. It's not 20 megapixel, but then I didn't find that much benefit from 20 megapixels. It doesn't have built-in stabilization, but then blah, blah, blah. The G7 represents great value. It's definitely one to check if you like the video aspect of the GX8, but you're after something a bit cheaper and you don't need the weather sealing. Yeah, and I want to throw in two other cameras. Actually, well, there's three. We should also mention the GH4, uh, which is, uh, well, how, how would you compare this to the GH4? Well, the GH4, which is their flagship model, is still quite a bit more expensive. It's a few hundred dollars more expensive than the GX8. And obviously, the GX8 prices that we, when we filmed this video were not discounted that much yet because it was a new camera. So the, will, that gap will widen, I expect. The GH4 has a centrally located viewfinder like the G7. I prefer that to the flat top style of the GX8. If you could show it, hold it up, Doug, you'll see that the viewfinder is perched in the corner. That's something I've not mentioned yet. Do you see how it's in that corner? It's like the Sony A6000. Some people like it there. Some people like it in the middle, more like a DSLR. I personally prefer a bit in the middle, so the GH4 is like that. Feature-wise, the GH4 is superior uh, for video because it, it does a one-to-one -one crop for 4K rather than scaling it, so you avoid artifacts much better. It does cinema 4K. It has a headphone jack. It has, it has that optional module that lets you output higher quality it does you know to an external recorder it will do uh i think it's 10 bit instead of 8 bit over the hdmi stuff like that it's it's a more professional product for video if you're if you're a professional filmmaker then you you would prefer the gh4 but in terms of still image quality 
Panasonic would say the GX8 is better because it's 20 megapixel. For me, there's not much difference. Mm -hmm. So there's not much difference in still quality. It's for video, you'd go for the GH4. I want to point out one thing about this viewfinder. All right, so here it is on the left. But I happen to be what's called a left eye shooter because my left eye is dominant. So what that means is for me, I have to hold the camera this way. uh, So the camera completely blocks my vision. And not only that, but my nose is almost perfectly centered over the LCD. That's normally not a problem, except for the fact that this LCD is touch sensitive. And the LCD is touch sensitive, I believe, even when your eye is up to the viewfinder. And Yeah, that's a feature. Happened, I got to tell you, when I took this and I started shooting this, the camera out of the box is set so that the LCD selects the focus point. And every time I put this up to the uh, my eye, my nose touched the camera and moved the focus point on the camera. The one thing that I must say that luckily solved the problem is you can reduce the sensitivity, I think, of the touch screen. And so that is, solved the problem. So this is called touchpad AF. And believe it or not, it's a feature. Uh, yes. The idea is, is that you can, um, you can move the AF area using the screen without taking your eye from the viewfinder. So it's supposed to be quicker. But like you, Doug, I'm also a lefty with my eye. And like you, I was operating it with my nose. Now, there's two solutions to this. One of them is that you actually train your nose to, to I thought of that. Just, I thought and you, that. Can, you can actually do it quite well. So I, I found that I could actually just like prod it with my nose and <laughs> move it quite accurately. The other thing you can do is turn it off. Um, turn off, it's called touchpad AF. Now, interestingly, the Olympus OMD EM10 Mark II, which is their mid-range product, so this is a kind of low-end product, they've now slightly copied this idea. They They also now let you adjust the AF area with the screen, the touch screen, while you're composing with the viewfinder. But the way they've done it, the way Panasonic does it, is that just the lightest touch will move it. So if you brush it with your nose, it will move it. But what Olympus requires you to do is it needs a prolonged press and hold and a drag. You actually need to drag. So instead of tapping to reposition, you need to drag. And you can't do that with your nose. Well, you, you could. You have to go, <laughs> and you're not going to do that. And it actually eliminates this problem. So hopefully Panasonic might copy Olympus back again and implement it that way because it actually becomes much better on the EM10 Mark II because, you, like I say, you have to actually drag it rather than tap it. Yeah, well, if, you, well, if you're composing that, with the screen, you tap it. But if you're doing the dual thing, you, you drag it. Yeah, I think, I think I found a setting in the camera that reduces the touch sensitivity. And that yeah. seems to have solved the problem. I just but turned it off. It was an interesting, interesting twist. The, the last thing I want to mention also I got from you, partially from your review, but partially from something you said here, uh, is two Sony options. One you mentioned it really caught me by surprise. You mentioned the original Alpha 7 camera, which, of course, has now been replaced by the, not replaced, but improved upon with the Alpha 7 Mark II. But that camera is the same price range, again, $1,100 US as opposed to this camera at $1,200. Um, to be honest, I think this camera is quite a bit better than the original Alpha 7. Uh, I own that Alpha 7. Now, it's apples to oranges. That's a full-frame camera. You're into an entirely different system. Okay, the other one that I don't think was mentioned in your written review, but we've talked about today, is the good old Alpha 6000, which today is around $550 US. So it is less than half the price of this camera. And we thought that by now Sony would have upgraded it to a 7,000 or a 6,100. But some of the speculation is that they haven't for two reasons. One is they're selling so many other cameras they can't afford to make any. The other is the 6,000 is still selling so well. Why replace it in the marketplace? I don't know what your guess is, but isn't that also a viable camera for competing with this, especially for this incredibly good continuous autofocus? Yes, Okay. <laughs> That's good. the answer. Good. Yes, yes. I mean, what it's really good at is, as you say, continuous autofocus at 11 frames per second. It can focus fast moving subjects and maintain that high burst rate. So if you're shooting action, it's, it's just amazing. However, I find the controls are horrible. It's not, for me, a pleasant camera to use. I use it because it just focuses very well when shooting bursts. I don't enjoy using it. And it also has a corner, flat top based viewfinder. I don't like that style. It doesn't have a touch screen. 
the screen is 16 by 9 shaped, so when you're shooting in any other aspect ratio, like 3 by 2 for the sensor, the image is becoming really small. But I think Sony's biggest mistake with the A6000, of course, it's easy to look ahead, although we all said it in our reviews, so Sony should have been listening, is that the NEX7 had an XGA viewfinder, as I recall. It was a really nice viewfinder. When they went to the A6000, which was arguably the upgrade for it in terms of handling, they reduced the quality of the viewfinder to an SVGA. It's 800 by 600 pixels. And it was fine a couple of years ago. It was fine. You know, it was a mid-range viewfinder. But now in the mid-range market, the Fuji X-T10, the Olympus OM-10 Mark II, all of these cameras now have nice big XGA um, OLED viewfinders. And in comparison, the Sony A6000 viewfinder is really suffering. It doesn't look anywhere near as good as a brand new camera. And if they hadn't downgraded that NEX7 viewfinder, it would be in such a better position now, I think. I would actually be able to say, no, you know, the A6000, it's got so much going for it. But I, staff, I have to mention the viewfinder. It's quite inferior to the ones on the newest cameras. And they did it to deliberately differentiate it from a higher end product that was the NEX7 and should now be an A7000. There should be an A7000 in the range or an A9000 or whatever they'll call it, but it never came. So they had this deliberately downgraded product to make room for a higher end one that's still not arrived. No. no. Very annoying. The, the, you know, the one thing is terrific the, value, terrific yeah, value. These, these rapid really changes good. are going to keep us busy, that's for sure, because the new cameras are they they amaze me. They continue to come out. Everybody, not just Sony, but everybody's coming out with more cameras. The improvements have not slowed down. I am awed by them. And but as we said, in this category, for example. You almost can't go wrong. Uh, they're just all so remarkable. Well, Gordon, thank you very much. I look forward to uh, another review with you. I want to encourage everybody to go to cameralabs.com to read the detailed review. Gordon also has some superb sample images, which are very important when evaluating this camera, especially for things like image stabilization. You'll really be able to see the difference there when you look at the uh, A-B comparisons of these things. Also, if you're interested in purchasing any of the cameras that we've discussed here on All About the Gear, go over to cameralabs.com. Click on the Buy Now links because the, the, the few pennies that we get uh, help to keep the program on the air. We very much appreciate that. Gordon, it's been a great one. Thank you, Doug. It's been a pleasure as always. And I love your new bandwidth. It's just I love moment. it too. I love it too. <laughs> Hopefully, all those issues of the past will remain in the past. Very good. All right. So I'll see everybody back here once again on another episode of All About the Gear.